Right, uh, we better get started then. So, this is the last of my series of lectures on protein secretion. Um, and this time it's looking more at protein targeting than secretion. Do you want to... I'll give you a minute to get those in. I'll just take the whole pile to the back. That's it. So, at the end of that, it won't be examined... Uh, and we'll see how time goes, but uh, I think, I'd like to think that you're driven by curiosity as much as by the exam, so we'll see how we go with that. But let's get through the stuff which may or may not appear in the exams, I have to say. I'm not going to tell you what's in the exams. There's no, the fact that what I've just said doesn't mean that you will get examined on this. Right, so when we look at the surface of organisms like Staphylococcus aureus, we find that they're decorated with these what are known as m strands microbial surface components recognising adhesive matrix molecules. These adhesin proteins, these are what mediate the attachment of those bacteria to host tissues. Um, and it's clear that those proteins are actually covalently linked to the peptidoglycan uh, in the bacterial cell wall. Now, back in the 1990s, when these were first discovered and named, that presented a puzzle. How on earth did you get proteins targeted to the cell wall and then linked onto the peptidoglycan in that way? Now, uh, this is a cartoon which I borrowed from um, Tim Foster, in fact. Did anyone go to Tim Foster's talk? No, you don't get told about the seminars, probably. Do you get told about the seminars? Or you just don't go? Yeah. Well, anyway. You might rec if you had gone to his talk, you'd recognise this, because I nicked this slide from him about ten years ago. Um, but this shows you uh, Staph aureus, the various surface proteins. They bind various ligands, things like fibrinogen, collagen, fibronectin, and so forth. They're all flapping around there out in the solvent, if you like, in the, making connection with the outside world. They're all tethered here into the cell wall and actually tethered to the peptidoglycan. He called sortes, which would sort these proteins on to the uh, bacterial cell surface and anchor them to the peptidoglycan. And that was actually a very nice example of kind of predictive biology, because he made this prediction in 1992, worked away in his lab for several years, and in 1999, he actually showed that this protein existed, this enzyme existed, by cloning it, sequencing it, purifying it, and characterising it. Um, so that was a very nice conclusion to that line of thought, that uh, this was what was going on, that there was an enzyme out there called sortase. It's clear from his initial studies that, these, that sortase was important because if you made a sortase mutant, you could just about make one, but the bacteria are defective in the display of surface proteins, they're very attenuated in animal models. Structures now being solved as well, in fact. Um, and this sortase what looked as if it was a normal secreted protein. It's got a signal peptide, goes to the sex system to be uh, secreted across the cytoplasmic membrane. And then it functions as a transpeptidase. Um, it forms this acyl intermediate with the cleaved surface protein and then links that protein, staples it, if you like, to a pentaglycine cross bridge in the peptidoglycan. And when you look at the sequences of these, and when you look at the structure as well, it's clear that there's this active site cysteine residue which is conserved in all of the members of this class of, of, of enzymes. And what sortase does is it recognises sort, recognizes a sorting signal within uh, the target protein. Sorting signal. And there's a, a particular motif, a conserved motif, which has been given the name LPXTG, after the one-letter amino acid code for the, the residues in that motif. X is any amino acid. And it was shown, even before sortase itself was actually... Uh, identified that if you messed around with this motif, fiddled with the sequence in there, that stopped the proteins from being linked to the cell wall, and in some cases even prevented them being secreted 
Now this signal is typically, in fact probably overwhelmingly, towards the C terminus, actually at the extreme C terminus of the protein in almost all cases. There are a few proteins, the IgA proteases, where it does occur in the middle, but they're very much the exception to the rule. So when we look at uh, the, just in one dimension here, the structure of a, a primary structure of a sauté substrate from Staph aureus, what we see is this. We see a signal sequence that targets it for secretion. There's a ligand binding domain, which will be the bit which is actually interacting with fibrinectin, fibrinogen, and other matrix proteins. There's usually some repetitive areas within the protein. Uh, a part that spans the cell wall, so this thing is having to go through bits of the uh, peptidoglycan. It may be tethered quite low down and has to get it all the way out. Then there is this LPXTG uh, motif here. And the very end of the protein, there tends to be this uh, hydrophobic membrane spanning region, which is actually cleaved off. So if we look at the reactions that sautase performs, what it does is, so we start off with the protein being, the target protein being exported with its LPX TG there at the C terminus. Tethers it in the membrane uh, so that it's, it's sitting there with the LPX TG just above the membrane. Sautase comes along and recognizes this uh, and cleaves uh, uh, between the three and the glycine there, uh, leaves this little tail, presumably this gets degraded somehow, and then this part here then is, this then is actually ligated on to the pentaglycine bridges within peptidoglycan. So we end up with the protein itself being covalently linked to this molecular chamber which forms um, the peptidoglycan uh, component of the cell wall. Look at it another way, it's just a, another figure I shamelessly stole from a, a, a paper uh, looking at the mechanism of the primary sautase, sautase A in Staph aureus. You have this um, protein sitting there with its LPXTG cleavage. Uh, you've got the pentaglycine here. Uh, you've got the neuronac and the glucnac. Uh, you've got this other uh, part of the um, cross-linking here, and the sautase tethers the protein in that way. Now, I got involved in this in 2001. It was a fruitful year. You saw I, in the previous lecture I wrote this thing about e ESX secretion. I also started looking at sautases uh, in collaboration with Tim Foster, who spoke the other day. And um, the presumption was in Olaf Schneewin's, I think, initial reasoning was that this was uh, a conserved protein. There would be one sautase in the cell, and it would be a bit like you know, the signal peptidases. It would, it would be a, a conserved thing that would just do this one job. I took a look at um, both the sautases and their substrates, looking at that motif and kind of making a rather um, sloppy kind of search for it um, with allowing some of those residues to change and so forth. And it became clear that actually this idea of one sautase um, and a number of substrates scattered around the genome was actually uh, rather unusual. The Staph aureus, the so-called canonical system, if you like, or the, the first system to be studied, was a bit unusual and that often what you saw are multiple sautases in the, in the, uh, encoded in the genome. And you often saw the sautases encoded by genes adjacent to their substrates. And there may be multiple substrates in, in a gene cluster. Um, so they turn out to be extremely uh, common in, in gram positives. Um, and, uh, we then, I made this point that speculate that these comprise of novel family of transpeptides is forming covalent links between peptide and or protein components at the cell surface and at the cell envelope. So the idea was 
floating in the wind, that the sortases might be more versatile than just simply stapling a protein to peptoglycan. Maybe there are stapling proteins to each other uh, in something more in a more sophisticated way. This is just a table from that paper, uh, just showing the range of organisms that uh, we found these sortases in. They range uh, across the uh, low GC and high GC uh, gram positives. So you've got things like Streptomyces coli there, Streptomyces, uh, Tylomyces lyslundii, and so forth. Um, and you can see here that we often see a cluster, clustering here. Two out of, uh, of seven of these genes adjacent to each other, adjacent to the LPXTG, uh, adjacent to LPXTG, and so forth. So it's now clear, uh, taking a recent review, that we know, building on that, over the intervening years, people have done experiments with organisms of different settings, with different classes of genes that there are actually a whole range of roles that are played by sortases. So the sort A, sortase A, sort, sort A, uh, you can see there, that's the one we were talking about initially, the, the one that Schneewin was uh, thinking about. <coughs> that is involved in tethering these proteins, and the proteins are then involved in uh, adhesion, immune evasion, internalization, and sometimes phage recognition as well. In Staph aureus, Turns out that there is a second sortase, it was completely unanticipated, known as uh, sortase B, and um, this has been uh, shown to be involved in iron acquisition um, and is involved in um, stapling proteins to the cell wall that actually scavenge iron. Two more things, one of which I did anticipate in my paper, the other one which we didn't really. Uh, are, are, are encoded by these uh, sortases in the classes C and D. So Kelly formation, which I'll say more in a moment, and spore formation, both which I'll say more about in a moment. Ah, so I forgot I've got a slide here on the second sortase, sortase B of Staph aureus. This doesn't recognise LPXTG. Instead, it recognises a motif, recognises a motif NPQTN, and it links uh, this protein ISDC to, a mature, to the mature assembled peptoglycan. Um, it, this is buried in the cell wall. It's not flapping around, sort of, sort of sorted at, uh, to the surface. In fact, some of the other components of the same system are actually sorted by sortase A. Uh, but this whole system work is working together to scavenge iron. Uh, from hemoglobin scavenging, so you get hemoglobin binding these ones on the surface and then they push iron down, pass, iron, uh, put, pass the iron on in the form of heme uh, into uh, these other components buried deeper in the cell wall and then there's transport systems that actually allow the, the heme to get across into the cytoplasm and then the iron within the cytoplasm there are mechanisms of ripping the iron out of the heme. Now, as I just mentioned a moment ago, sortases are now known to assemble pili in gram positives. Now, pili in gram positives, we mentioned before about pili in gram negative bacteria, but for many years, uh, pili in gram positives were neglected as the kind of poor cousins of the pili we saw in gram negatives. Um, and in fact, in some cases, in Streptococcus pneumonia, they, they weren't recognized until relatively late in the game. <coughs> They're very thin. They're not seen by standard EM. You need to have some kind of immuno electron microscopy to label the proteins with immuno gold or so forth. But unlike the gram negative pili, where you get the subunits polymerizing just using um, non covalent interactions, hydrophobic interactions, or, or those you mentioned, um, the donor strand exchange and so forth those kind of reactions. Here, the proteins actually appear to be covalent, the subunits are covalently linked together. So the, if in a sense, the whole pillars is one long molecule. Um, and that makes these pili extremely stable. They can survive boiling in, 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 in SDS. Uh, they can 
survive in formic acid. It's very hard to disrupt them. If you um, sonicate the cells, these pili will not fall apart. So that was all rather remarkable. Um, and the answer to what, how that came to, to be, I did, as I say, predict in that paper that, that these pili and subunits were actually uh, going to be stapled together by um, a, a sortase homologue. And particularly, we, we saw in, in that paper, we, we could see in the genomes of various organisms, uh, sortase homologs and pillin subunits clustered together. Um, and there was a, just before I wrote that paper, um, a scientist, Dr. Lung, Leung, in California, was working on um, pili production in, in, in Actinomyces nasalundii. Uh, she had identified a dependency for the production of the pili on a, an enzyme. She didn't realize that enzyme was sortase, I don't think. Sadly, she was uh, run over in a traffic accident <coughs> just before this came to fruition. I think she would have got to pili and to sortase before anyone else. Uh, she was very close. But in fact, it was Schneewin that, that first went in and showed that, yes, indeed, pili, like these pili, are made by sortases, stapled together. Um, and then this was followed up. There's now been several papers showing the same thing is true in streptococci. And here you can see these pili. And these have been labelled with uh, immunogold labelling against uh, the subunits. Uh, and now we uh, have a wide range of bacteria in which uh, you can find gene clusters encoding these pili. Uh, there are the homologous components there are uh, colour-coded. Um, so you can see we have them in Pinomyces, Strep pyogenes, Strep pneumoniae, and C. diphtheriae. Uh, in C. diphtheriae, there are several of these clusters, in fact, uh, encoding different kinds of pili. And what's now thought to happen is that you have this um, tip protein. So again, this is a bit reminiscent of gram-negative pili. So in gram-negative pili, we've got used to the idea that the subunits that polymerize to form the filamentous part of the organelle um, are actually different from those that are found at the extreme tip that act as the adhesins. The same is true in these gram-positive pili. We have this tip protein that's got an LPXTG motif in there. And then there's a sortase homologue, which in this uh, figure here is called the pilin, uh, polymerase, or PIP, that is involved in um, the initial steps of joining that tip protein to a protein from the shaft, another LPXTG protein that forms a shaft. Then what happens is that these are then polymerized. There's some change in specificity. I'm not sure if we understand that yet as to why uh, we only put one tip protein in um, or, or whatever. But then we go on, and these are then polymerized, stapled together. So you get this extending pillus growing at the um, proximal end. And then when it reaches a certain point, and again, I don't know if we understand when that checkpoint is, how that checkpoint is recognized, the sortase A, typical sortase, comes in and then ligates the whole lot. Not just that one protein here, as it would normally do, but the whole pillin is then transferred and ligated onto the uh, peptidoglycan uh, in the cell wall. Uh, this I just took from a review, just shows you there the, the are equivalences. There are major subunits that, that, that form the um, pillars itself. There are this minor tip subunit, various things uh, dispersed and assembly factors and chaperones that have been described and so on. So on. Another um, the uh, role of sortases that was not recognized uh, initially was in bacterial differentiation. Um, uh, so in Bacillus anthracis, we have this salt C, it's actually a member of the salt D class, uh, that cleaves this LPNTA motif. Um, and this is expressed during sporulation in the forcefore and in the mother cell, depending on a particular response regulator, 
Um, and then their various proteins are actually anchored to the peptidoglycan of the four spore and mother cell, respectively. Um, and this appears to be an integral part of the sporulation uh, process, particularly in, in vivo, in host cells. Another group of proteins that are uh, anchored to the cell wall by sautés are these things called chaplains, which have been described in um, Streptomyces coli. So we would noticed in, in that 2001 paper all these sauté substrates in Streptomyces. I've tried to get the Streptomyces uh, researchers in this country interested, but they just ignored me for a while. And then suddenly, a few years later, they came up with this story with the, the chaplains and the sautés. Um, and we have these long chaplains that are active to, uh, anchored to the cell wall by sautés, and then they bind and, uh, and, and allow as a nucleation point for these so-called short chaplains. And this produces a hydrophobic sheath that encases the, the, the aerial filaments that are produced by these bacteria. So Streptomyces silicor is a bacterium which produces uh, these special differentiated forms, the so-called aerial hyphae. And these chaplains are involved in that. So sautase is pretty fundamental to various biological processes. Now, an interesting development uh, on the back of all this understanding of sautase, you might say, well, okay, it's very elegant to understand this stuff, but where, where does it lead? Does it take us anywhere forward? Does it help anything? Does it help us anyway? Well, in the last uh, few years, there's actually been a lot of interest in actually using sautase as a tool in biotechnology. So there's this paper here, with this rather florid title, Sautés Mediated Ligation, a gift from gram-positive bacteria to protein engineering. So if you read that paper, there are lots of different applications that are being found for sautés. Here's a simple one, which is that you can uh, take a, a protein of interest, stick your sautés recognition domain, the LPXTG on the end, and um, the sautés will then ligate that to a uh, pentaglycine or polyglycine um, uh, moiety here that's stuck on whatever you like, any, any old molecule, any unnatural molecule you like. The ligation will still take place, and then you can tether your protein to that unnatural molecule. So that's a very nice kind of way of, of, of stapling things together in a controlled way. In fact, you can go further than that. You could have your uh, pentaglycines on a solid support, and you could make kind of protein arrays on that solid support, um, and they would get ligated onto it. And as I say, if you're interested to see the rest of the paper, there are lots of other applications of sautases there. Another interesting uh, reason for looking at sautase is that it's a potential drug target, because obviously we don't have sautases in our cells, um, so it's, a, it's a promising drug target for treatment of gram-positive infections. Um, one of the things that, that makes it attractive is that sautase is required for virulence um, in, in these systems. It's not abs required absolutely for life. Uh, you could argue, therefore, that it may, the chances of breeding out resistance are going to be less. Uh, when you're targeting virulence and adhesion rather than actual just the ability to survive. There are several different classes of inhibitor being described, and some of them are looking quite good. Reasonable inhibition, specificity, mechanisms. Um, and these are moving forward towards uh, <coughs> clinical trials uh, in the preclinical stage, as I understand at the moment. I haven't checked the literature to see if a clinical trial has actually started with any of these yet. But uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, line of work which uh, hopefully might deliver new antimicrobials, which we actually desperately need for things like MRSA. Okay, so that was all I was going to tell you about sautés. If, um, if, you, if you're interested, I could just tell you about a, a little project kind of related to this sort of stuff that bubbling away in our group. We haven't actually done much work on it at the moment, but we're interested to sort of get started. Does anyone want to hear that, or do you just want to go and go and have a cup of coffee? You can, you can vote, whichever way you like.
Nobody strongly fit. Um, you're not going to get examined on these the next few slides, but I thought I'd just uh, rather than just talk for half an hour, I talk for maybe 45 minutes, and then. Uh, so, this is an interesting problem that we've come across. Um, this mystery of gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria. So, in my group, we're very interested in chickens, uh, and particularly the chicken guts. Uh, you might wonder why should we be interested in chickens? Well, chickens are the most abundant bird in the world, the most abundant food animal in the world. Um, if you want to be a bit perverse, you could even say they're the most abundant dinosaur in the world. Now we recognise that all birds are dinosaurs. Uh, chickens, are, chicken soup was even eaten on the far side of the moon by the Apollo astronauts. So it kind of gives you a measure of the cosmic significance of chickens to the world. And there are several billion of them, more than there are of humans. And we're particularly interested in the chicken shit, as we might call it. As we call this the chicken shit project when we talk to ourselves. And we're interested in, I actually lived in this part of the bowel, the, the cecum of the chicken. So one of my uh, postdocs has been sequencing the DNA extracted from the cecum, the bacterial DNA, just to see what's there. Uh, doing various things, extracting molecular barcodes and, and trying to take a census. And at the top, all, the most abundant organism we found was this organism called Megamonas, um, which was uh, pretty much the, yeah, was the number one. Now, I kind of thought, well, I'd never heard of that organism before. Let's go and see what that's about. When I looked in the literature, found this little taxonomic note from a few years ago. And it seems that this Megamonas... It's initially called a Bacteroides because it appeared to be gram-negative. When they got out the 16S ribosomal RNA sequence from the organism, that's a very common thing we do in taxonomy that's used as a kind of molecular barcode for bacteria. When that was hoiked out and sequenced, it was clear that this organism actually belonged within uh, a uh, gram-positive uh, gram clade within the so-called Firmicutes, and its close relatives, you can see here, Bilinella, uh, here we've got Peptococcus, and, and um, uh, so this, this uh, Clostridium up here, this, so this is actually um, a, a, a group of bacteria which are in the Firmicutes, in this low G, G, G plus C group of, of gram positives. So that, that struck me as a bit odd. So, you know, how can you get something so fundamentally wrong as thinking it's a bacteroides one minute and then thinking it's actually in the Clos Clostridiales next? Um, so we had a look. There's actually a genome sequence of uh, one Megamonas, Megamonas hypermegaly out there. Um, and noticed it was classified in this thing called ne negative acuities. So I don't know what that's about. Turns out that although the 16S is telling you it's a, it belongs with the gram positives, it's got proteins in its, encoded in its genome which are clearly gram negative proteins. You've got proteins for lipid A production. So it's producing lipopolysaccharide. And in fact, we went through and it looks like it's got all the proteins for making an outer membrane, which is odd, you know. Gram positive bacteria, we don't have an outer membrane, that's part of the definition of it. So, it, it, so what we have is this strange, strange thing of a gram negative bacterium falling within a gram positive clade according to the usual taxonomic tools. It's just odd. Now, you might, has anyone got any explanation for this? What would you think might have happened? Why is the 16S telling us it's gram positive, whereas some of these proteins telling us it's gram negative? One obvious thing that's sprung to mind in our heads. I mean, we were going to say, we had a thought there. No, we're not going to say. I mean, one option is it just borrowed the 16S by horizontal gene transfer. The rest of it's a gram negative. Just happens to take the 16S or maybe some ribosomal RNA genes in general from gram positives and that was that was what accounted for it. But in fact, if you go through the genome and you look at all of the kind of housekeeping genes and proteins, they all look like gram-positive proteins. They're closest relatives to another gram-positives. 
It's only these weird things that are involved in the gram-negative uh, outer membrane production, like a polysaccharide and outer membrane proteins and so forth, that are actually not gram-positive but gram-negative in their origins. Um, in fact, uh, uh, a few years ago, well, a couple of years ago, um, this this um, protein called uh, this. Uh, a species called Negativococcus was uh, Negativococcus succinia borans was named, and a new class of the ne ne negative acuities was uh, defined based on the f on this kind of gram positiveness, uh, gram negativeness in a gram positive group, um, and and they brought together various members there. Now, if you think about this, this is a bit like a kind of centaur, you know, half man, half horse, you know, half gram positive, half gram negative. I mean, we all like to think of the world in tidy compartments. A bacteriologist is no different. As far as we're concerned, gram positives for one thing, gram negatives for another. You can't have a chimera, a mixer of the two. And it's still, so it's, it's a real mystery as to what's gone on here. Um, in fact, in that paper, they showed that indeed you can, in some of these bacteria, in Bionella, I think it is, you can actually, people have done the experiments where you can see an outer membrane. Like these freeze fracture approaches on the electron microscopy and a cytoplasmic membrane, it looks like a gram negative in its cell envelope. So 16S and all the housekeeping genes are saying it's gram positive, it's got a gram negative cell envelope, and we see the genes for that in there as well. We, we had a quick look to see what. Uh, whether there were any other relatives of this lipid A disaccharide synthase that we've seen. In fact, you can see there are loads of other things. Violinella, Selenomonas, uh, Dialister. And Dialister actually turned out to be quite common in our, uh, in our chicken uh, ship project as well. So it appears that there's actually quite a sizable number of bacteria that fall within this, probably at the, we're probably at the stage of at least 50, maybe more than that, uh, maybe get on for 100 different bacteria that fall, species that have been named that fall within this negative acuities. Um, and in trying to scope around this problem, I did some literature searches and found this paper here, which came up with an organism called Halothermothrix aurenii. aurenii. Um, and this was even more of a kind of do your head in type organism because it's in the gram positive phylum, Firmicutes, it's got a gram negative type of cell wall. It's got lipopolysaccharide, characteristic of gram negatives. But the weird thing is that it actually has a sporulation mechanism. So, again, in our tidy minds, we think about gram positives, gram negatives. And among the gram positives, there are those that sporulate, so the bacillus. Uh, Clostridia, and then there are those that don't, like Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes and so forth. But here we have a gram-negative bacterium with a gram-negative cell envelope with a mechanism for sporulation. So again, it's completely weird. And this not yet has not yet been classified in the negative acuities. I think it really does need to be reclassified, and that group needs to be broadened. But um, it just... Uh, when they analyze the genome, they say there's a lipid A modification system there, lipid A pathway, um, all of those things that, that you expect to find uh, are, are there. Um, and in fact, you even find outer membrane subunits of type 2 and type 3 secretion systems. Uh, there's a flagellum, I think, in there, and it's got a, a typical um, outer membrane protein forming a ring in, in the outer membrane. Uh, encoded in the genome. But then there are these um, homologues of, the, uh, of um, genes involved in sporulation in bacilli and, 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 and clostridia. So bacillus has been studied a great deal in terms of the, the sporulation mechanism. And it's just weird to sort of think you've got this strange organism it actually lives in a strange environment, very halophilic. It's gram negative, but it's got all this sporulation stuff. And um, if we look at uh, looking at the papers that you know they have, they don't uh, these uh, negative acuities don't have the brawn lipoprotein, 
Have you heard, you've been told about this, haven't you, by Andy, I think, about the, um, how the uh, CERN like, works in gram negatives. Uh, here they, they actually, uh, they don't have that, they, they cross-link their LPS and outer membrane proteins um, with cadaverine. Um, they have these S-layer proteins uh, and they also have endospores. So we're back to chickens in a sense in that what we have here is a kind of chicken or egg situation. Which came first, the gram-positive cell with a single membrane uh, and sporulation in some of them, or the gram-negative cell with its double membrane? Um, you can argue it both ways. You can say, well, it's easy, easy to imagine how a sim simple cell, I mean, gram-positive cells are simpler kind of thing, they would have evolved first and then all the gram-negatives would have come afterwards. But there are other people that argue, no, no that's not the case, that the gram-negative cell is, uh, it, it is the ancestral state and gram-positive cells, the things we see in the Firmicutes, have actually lost their outer membrane. They once had it and now they've lost it. Now, you can argue, and, and, and in fact, just today, this is why I'm talking about this, because it, it piqued my thing, they came across a paper which looked at this further. So there's all these kind of things to be explained, you know, all these mysteries hanging around. Um, and I just read, saw this paper this morning, actually, um, where they have actually taken a look at um, sporulation in one of these organisms that is uh, supposedly a, a member of the Firmicutes, but is um, uh, gram-negative in terms of its cell envelope. Um, uh, and as I said, surprisingly gram-negative, possessing inner and outer membranes, present macromolecular res macromolecular resolution, 3D electron uh, cryotomographic images. And that what they did was they followed these cells through the vegetative phase, the sporulating phase, and the germination phase as well. And the weird thing is, how do you boot up? If you're going to make spores and then vegetate uh, and then germinate, uh, sorry, sporulate and then germinate, how do you get your, your outer membrane back again? Um, and they, what they show here um, is that the inner membrane of the mother cell is inverted and becomes the outer membrane of the germinating cell. And so the outer membrane is actually derived from the inner membrane, which is something which we've never predicted before would happen. Um, and so they have this outer membrane, which is... A remodeled version of this outer spore membrane. It still doesn't take us forward as to, we still don't know, uh, you know, the bacteriologists have still got no consensus on which came first, the gram positive cell, the gram negative cell. We've got no consensus on the order in which the different bacterial phyla diverge. But this is a kind of weirdness that just kind of links many of the things you've been taught about gram negative cell envelopes and gram-positive cells uh, as well. It's a, it is a kind of weirdness. So it's, it's just worth remembering that you know, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of uh, in our philosophy. Right, that's me finished. I'm going to say goodbye and good luck. This is my last lecture. I wish you luck in your exams.